This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review with Gilad Halpern. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern, and every week I'll be engaging in close encounters of the intellectual kind with writers and scholars, or simply people of ideas of all types and vocations who have done something to make our lives a tad more interesting. My guest today is a faculty member at the Yiddish Center at Bar-Ilan University, and we're here today to discuss one of her main research interests, which is representations of the underworld and criminality in early 20th century Yiddish literature. Dr. Aviv Atal, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, good ad. I'm, I'm just wondering, by way of introduction, Why did you choose to focus on criminality in the underworld? Is, was it such a major theme and phenomenon in the period that you research? Well, since I mainly research the 20th century and the Yiddish civilization, as we call it, in the 20th century, the underworld was a part of it. They weren't living in... enclosers or enclaves. Mm-hmm. They had their separate languages, but they were living among the Jewish population. They were meeting every day. They were part of the Yiddish uh, weaving of life between the two world wars. Mm-hmm. Was it organized crime as we know it today or in the post-war period? What kind of modalities uh, did it have? Well, Uh, there were all kinds. First of all, the underworld, the Jewish underworld, had its hierarchy. Uh, they even had their own courts. And in the courts, uh, they even discussed problems between the normal, so to speak, population and the underworld. And if the normal population felt that they were robbed unjustly, mm-hmm. They took it to what was called the Admor of the thieves, the Rebbe. Yeah, the big of sage. The, the big sage of the mm-hmm. thieves, uh, who was getting a salary, by the way. This mm-hmm. was his work. And uh, he, if he found that the thieves took too much money from someone, he usually made them pay it back. Uh-huh. There's one very well-known... anecdote about Warsaw uh-huh. before Second World War. Because I'm, I'm wondering, what does it mean to be robbed unjustly? Unjustly well, means uh, that they took money from people who couldn't afford to be right. <laughs> robbed. Uh-huh. <laughs> It was a kind of social justice. Uh-huh. So, they had so it's okay to rob from the rich, but not from the poor. Very okay. Uh-huh. On the contrary. But if you rob from the poor, you have to give it back. So one day, a shopkeeper, a poor shopkeeper comes to this judge of the underworld and tells him, listen, last night they cleaned me out. So he said, give me 24 hours, I'll ask around. And then the next morning he came, he said, I'm sorry, these weren't my people. These were the Chassidim from the Gur, uh, yeah, the Hasidic, uh, uh, Hasidic uh, Gur, yeah. and I have no influence over them. Uh-huh. <laughs> I But, can't give you justice. And, and that was the, the, the um, geographical space that we're talking about is Eastern Europe, Warsaw, and uh, other places in, in Poland and, uh, and around it. Uh, where were the authorities in all this? Well, the authorities were paid off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's put it this way. It is mainly a phenomena of the big cities like Odessa, Warsaw, Bialystok, Vilna. Mm-hmm. And, and it was Paris. out in the open. I mean, they, of course. They, they didn't uh, uh, jeopardize their good name in any way to be no. part of the underworld. It was a legitimate... Uh, occupation for, for those people. Completely. It was a Yiddish parnusi, which uh-huh. means it was one of the Jewish working establishments as well as being a rebbe or being a shopkeeper. Mm-hmm. And they were intermingled and they were living one near to another. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's very famous that, for example, Yitzhak B'Shevi Zinger, who writes about the Jewish underworld in Warsaw, mm-hmm. he also writes about his father, who had a base din, a small court. Yep. And the court was near a brothel, a Jewish brothel. Mm-hmm. So was the writer's club in Warsaw. One entrance was to the writer's club. One entrance was to a famous Jewish brothel. Mm-hmm. And weren't there any moralistic people who said uh, that this is anathema to Jewish existence and uh, it's plain wrong? No. no. None whatsoever? It... No, no. It was a part of the Jewish life. That's it. They, they knew each other. They greeted each other in the street. They knew to whom to come if they had a problem. And uh, they had a very, very, uh, not only hierarchical um, order, but there was a kind of moral degree which the Jewish population could count on. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, that when, they were like militias that would uh, yes. protect them? Yes, yes. Uh-huh. There was, a, well, this is something that we don't know it by name, but there was for centuries someone within the underworld who was in charge of keeping the peace in, mm-hmm. within the general population. Uh, are we talking only about the Jewish community? Yes. Mm, no, but w- were those people uh, had any dealings with uh, non-Jews? Uh, were there criminals that they associated with? Or were some of the victims non-Jewish? Or did it all remain in the family, as it were? No, many victims were non-Jewish. For example, the famous writer, Uken Achalnik, had his own gang and he was robbing banks. He didn't rob banks of Jews. He robbed the general banks in Poland. Mm-hmm. And so he was caught by the police. But even when he was sitting in a Polish jail, which was a hardcore jail, they let him write. Uh-huh. And then in his writing, that might be a good uh, uh, way to segue into uh, your topic of research, which is literature, essentially. Yes. Um, how prominently did all this feature in Nachalnik's writing and perhaps other writers? Well, it depends from which point of view the writers wrote. If they were writers from what we call the normal side, like Sholem Ash or Itzhak Bashevi Zinger or Avram Karpinovich here in Israel... Uh, they would write as outsiders, but as knowing outsiders with a deep knowledge of the people. And they always claimed that their writings are based on real people. On the other hand, Ulken Khalnik, uh, his real name, this is an alias, by the way. Uh-huh. His real name was Yitzhak Perverovich. Mm-hmm. Uh, his relative lived in Israel. And uh, he was a thief. He was born into a very respectable family. And the first man he stole from was his father. Uh And then he went to the yeshiva. And he was considered a genius. In the yeshiva, he was adopted by the local Jewish madame who had a brothel. Mm-hmm. But she fed him as a yeshiva bucher because those who were going to yeshiva had to rely on the good heart of the balabatim mm-hmm. to feed them. Uh-huh. So she took upon herself to feed him. So he saw what was going on in her house and he collected his first gang in the yeshiva. And then he went out on a thieving excursions. And there was no problem for a Shiva Bucha to breach the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal? Is no. the Eighth? I'm not sure it's the Eighth. But the command- no. there was a- a- absolutely no, no problem with that. No problem with it. I mean, the minute he became secular, he left the religion, he was lost to the conservative Jewish world, to the orthodox world, and he might as well be dead. 
So it doesn't matter what he yeah. did. He was lost, <laughs> a lost soul. Uh-huh. Anyhow, and Parvarovich went on. He liked thieving. He never killed anyone, by the way. Uh, he had his own gang. And only when he went in big ways to try and, and rob the National Bank of Poland was he caught. He was not caught before. Mm-hmm. And then in prison, he started to be a writer because he was a very learned person. Yes. He wrote beautifully and he published his first book upon leaving jail. And he later made a wonderful living. One of the only stories, I believe, within the two world wars in which a writer was very rich because he wrote bestsellers about the underworld. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Um, what, what did this do, the open and overt existence of criminality within Jews there and then? What did it do to stoke anti-Semitism that was already rampant in those parts uh, of Europe so as to say that Jews are undermining the pillars of society? Well, this is very strange because in the underworld, there was some kind of a special amity or a, um, can I say, friendship mm-hmm. between underworld non-Jewish, underworld Jewish. Mm-hmm. When there was a big enterprise, they joined forces. So if they wrote about it in the paper, they wrote about the gang. There was not, the Jew robbed me. So, the so, Jew robbed me was the banker. So, so maybe I'll ask uh, the opposite question. What yes. did it do to help the Jews assimilate better into or integrate better into the general Polish society? Because they were really part and parcel of society. In well, sense. well, what is very, very strange is that they were very observant Jews. In their homes, they observed the Jewish law. Their wives, who usually were ex-prostitutes, uh-huh. were going with a scheitel or with a headscarf. They went to shul. They were accepted in shul. They led a very traditional Jewish life. Mm-hmm. And this is a strange thing. They didn't assimilate. They didn't become Christians. Mm-hmm. They stayed Jewish. Even though they, uh, they stole. Well, their panusa had <laughs> yeah, nothing yeah. to do with it. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a panusa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and was any of this replicated in the post-war uh, period after all these places, the Jewry in these places had all been virtually uh, uh, exterminated and they went on to America, into Israel? Were any of these structures replicated in, in the n- new world as no. well? No, no. Um, this is also a question that was uh, frequently asked about Jewish gangsters in the States, for example. Mm-hmm. Why wasn't there a what we call a second generation of Jewish gangs and mafia in the States? They didn't want their children. They wanted their children to have a life within the normal society. Mm. So we hear about the fathers. We don't hear about the sons. Their sons are usually educated, uh, university graduates. Uh, they hold very important jobs. And um, it's, it's just part of the family history that the father or the grandfather was a head of a gang mm-hmm. in Poland so, or so, the Ukraine. So, so would you say that their engagement in criminality signified, and again, this also feeds into literature perhaps, signifies some sort of disillusionment with their prospects in Eastern Europe, in their pale of settlement, as it were, uh, that they couldn't quite become part of the place after all? Well, no, because uh, the underworld sprang from poverty. And the First World War, so to speak, opened all possibilities. Law stopped. So this was, on one hand, uh, they had no choice. They had to eat. Mm -hmm. So many of the 
Jewish underworld, the famous gangs of the Jewish underworld, sprang out of terrible poverty that First World War caused and the displacement of people after First World War. Mm-hmm. For example, Sholem Ash, whom you mentioned when he wrote Motke Ganev, this is about... Motke the Thief, yeah. Motke the Thief, or... The wonderful, wonderful writer Varshavsky, who wrote the book Shmuglaris, Smug- which the smugglers. the smugglers, he writes about smuggling. Uh, look, smuggling was a very ancient Jewish parnusse, mm-hmm. very ancient. If a Jewish family lived near a river or a lake, they were smugglers because mm-hmm. it was possible. And here it became a profession. And the reason is the war. They were together with uh, other poor people, other Polish poor people, or the German soldiers mm. who were placed in their shtetl to oversee them, but they got paid. And they got paid in various manners, whether by money or by booze. Or by sex. Mm-hmm. And uh, Varshavsky shows in this wonderful book how even the Rebbe and the teacher and the Kleikoidish, which means like the very observant people in the small community, have to become smugglers in order to survive. I wonder why... If it's such a big part of the folklore of the time, as indeed is reflected by numerous uh, um, works of literature, why, why was this all but forgotten? And the reason that I'm really surprised at all you're, you're telling me now that it was such a big thing, it wasn't a, an aberration or a curiosity, it was really part of the Jewish Fabric of life, as you said. Absolutely. Because after Second World War, the whole matter of Jewish life, before it was exterminated in Europe, uh, received some kind of a saintly halo. Mm-hmm. I mean, you speak about the war Ghetto, you don't speak about the crazy parties and the ample food that the underworld had in the Warsaw Ghetto, you only show this part that shows the misery, the hunger, the mm-hmm. sickness. Right. And so it is with the other places. You speak about martyrdom. You don't speak about the fact that actually the Jewish underworld were part of the Jewish police who rounded up the Jews who were to be selected and sent to the death camps. Mm -hmm. They were part of the establishment. And in a very curious way, they didn't stand up, even though they were holding weapons. They had authority. Mm -hmm. But somehow, against an organized foreign power, whether it was the Red Army in Russia, as is told in the stories of Isaac Babel, uh-huh. or it is the Germans, yeah, the Nazi Germany, the Nazi Nazi Germany mm-hmm. in Poland and Germany, they somehow lost their courage mm-hmm. in face of this brutality. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. It's a fact. So in, in the uh, uh, bottom line, they utterly failed. And that's perhaps yes. one of the reasons they were pushed aside when they were really needed. They failed to, to protect the, the, or at least try and stand up for the community. Well, except in the Warsaw Ghetto, where the Jewish organization, the Jewish fighting organization, who was headed by Mordechai Nilevich, mm-hmm. was staying in the bunker, in the very well-equipped bunker of Iser. During the uprising. Thing. During during the uprising, uh, they were staying in the b- very well-equipped bunker of Iser, who was one of the heads of the underworld in the ghetto. And um, the famous bunker of Mila 18 was actually the bunker of the Warsaw Jewish underworld. Mm-hmm. And of course, 
nobody knows about it. Mm-hmm. Leon Uris, when he wrote his famous novel, Mila 18, didn't mention <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe because it's not as illustrious as uh, he, want, he wanted it to be. Well, of course. Yeah. You mm-hmm. want, uh, this, is, this is already this a matter of... This halo of sanctity, as you said. Of yes. sanctity. It's already a matter of politics mm-hmm. and of the politics of the Holocaust. <laughs> Wow. Which is another matter altogether. Absolutely. Well, this is all very fascinating. And I really thank you for coming in today and shedding some light on this uh, rather obscure episode in uh, modern Jewish history. So uh, thank you for coming in and thank you for doing this uh, valuable work, Dr. Aviva Tal, uh, faculty member at the Yiddish Center at Barilan University. Thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. That brings us to the end of our show today. Thank you very much for listening. Also, big thanks to Alex Benish, the technical producer of this show. I'm Gilad Halpern, signing off here in Tel Aviv. Do join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.